um, full day innovation in housing research event. But really what we're moving on to now uh, is more of a practitioner focused event and looking at how we can actually enable some of the sustainable innovation that we may have looked at um, throughout the opening section of the day, actually integrating this within UK housing supply. As you can see on the screen, um, this event is actually being run as part of a series of Grantham Centre uh, events organised by PhD students here at the University of Sheffield. I'm obviously one of these students that's been responsible for organising this event, but as well as me, um, we've had Will Michelson, we've had Abraham and Philippa, who I'm sure many of you will know. So a massive thanks goes out to those guys for uh, also helping us organise this event. Before I give you a bit more detail of the event and pass over to our chair, um, there's just a small amount of housekeeping um, that I would like to uh, run through. If you'd like to operate your microphone, um, please try and unmute this if you want to ask a question. Um, there will be allocated time for this, and obviously we don't want people to be speaking or um, talking over other participants. If you do want to ask a question um, and you don't want to use your microphone, feel free to put this uh, in the chat. If you do do this, however, um, if you could try and use the app function um, to indicate to us and to the chair who it is you would like to uh, direct your question to, that would be fantastic. Apart from that, we've got IT support in with us today. Um, so if you have any kind of problems using the Blackboard Collaborate interface or any kind of connection problems, please just pop them in this chat and uh, we'll do the best we can um, to sort all those with you. There has been a slight change uh, in proceedings today um, and this is related to the chair. Unfortunately, Tom Moore, who was supposed to be chairing the event today, is unable to attend um, as a result of him being on strike. Because of this, uh, Philip has very kindly decided to step in and she will be chairing the event and uh, you know, fielding questions that come from you guys to the speakers and also introducing these speakers one by one. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Philippa, uh, who will now be chairing the event from now on. Like I say, if there's any further questions or things that we can support you with, please do put them in the chat because we've got a little uh, army of helpers behind the scenes that will be able to get back to you as Philippa uh, works on the event. Thank you very much. Philippa, 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 you're on mute. <laughs> it had to be. We've gone a whole day. We've gone a whole day without one person talking on mute. So someone had to do it. Someone had to do it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, thanks for attending. Um, my name's Philippa. I'm a PhD student at the University of Sheffield in Urban Studies and Planning. I'm also a Grantham Scholar, like Charles said. Um, yeah, Tom, my supervisor, unfortunately can't be here today because he's participating in strike action at the University of Liverpool. So um, our group of Grantham scholars were all interested in issues surrounding sustainability and housing and the built environment. Um, so as you be aware, there are quite a few widely discussed problems within the UK housing stock in different areas. For example, on the social side, we have affordability pressures, um, the struggles to create cohesive communities and on the environmental side we have excessive resource consumption and issues with energy efficiency just as an example so combating these issues not only requires an imminent and significant increase in the number of houses that are developed or made available to people but it also means that these really must be affordable they must act to mitigate climate change and they must try and combat inequality so for our event, we wanted to focus on new ideas within housing that were not only tackling problems with housing, but actually what I find really interesting about the projects our speakers are going to talk about. Um, they use housing as a force for good in creating more sustainable futures. Um, so our three practitioners are all involved in developing new housing in the UK that operates outside of business as usual. I say the UK, I think it is all England as well. So it's even more specific, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, so these projects don't just develop new units of housing, but they do so in a way that centres social and environmental sustainability and engender a kind of wider appreciation of the role of housing in our lives. So, yeah, we think these projects demonstrate the ways housing developments could be done differently to contribute to a more socially and environmentally sustainable future. Um, we'll be hearing from Claude Hendrickson at Leeds Community Homes, Tim Crabtree from Wessex Community Assets and Kat Quigley from Nationwide. So we'll hear from each of the speakers in turn and then we'll have quite a bit of time for questions at the end. So we'll do all of them at the end. Um, please put your questions in the chat 
And if it's intended for a specific speaker, please indicate that. Hopefully there will also be some questions that maybe the speakers can take from different angles. Um, yeah, so our first speaker is Claude. Claude is heavily involved in community-led housing, especially um, self-build in Leeds and beyond. He is an accredited community-led housing advisor and has a particular focus on increasing participation in community-led housing from black and brown people in the UK. He has a wealth of experience across different housing and community projects, so I really look forward to hearing what he has to say today. Um, yeah, welcome Claude. And can we share Claude's slides for him? Um, I Can think Claude might have connection problems because I can yeah. see him now reconnecting. Hopefully it will be fine once he reconnects. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, maybe... He's back now. Hi Claude, uh, you might have missed your introduction, but um, if you're ready to go, then um, we'd love to hear from you. You should be able to see your slides. Can you see me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, perfect. Great. Thanks Hello. so much. Whoa. Do I, is it better to keep my video on or keep it off? Because it seems to be dropping in and dropping out. Uh, yeah, maybe you can keep the video off and just go through the slides. Um, whatever works. OK, we'll see how it goes and see if it jumps in and, and jumps out. OK. Um, I, I looks like I've drawn drawn the short straw, so um, I'm going first. Good afternoon and welcome to everybody, far and wide in this COVID period. Um, thank you, Philippa and the team for inviting me to share my journey um, and um, my story about pushing and beating the drum, how we can um, enable sustainable um, community-led housing my name's Claude Hickson. Um, I'm based in, Ch in Leeds, um, but I, I go out nationally. I'm speaking all around the country and I'm working with groups up and down the country. I'm an accredited advisor, a community-led housing accredited advisor, and I am um, the Equalities, Diversity and Inclusion Associate with Leeds Community Homes. Um, right, ready to go. I'll take you on my journey within the community-led housing sector, which is a journey over 25 years. Um, I'm going to show you what, in, what was my inspiration, my observations, implementation of projects and continuous promotion of the community-led sector. Right, back in back in the eight in the sixties and early eighties, obviously um, I'm of that Windrush generation. I'm one of the children that was born of the Windrush generation. And back in the sixties and eighties, in communities like we had here in Chapeltown and many black communities and many other um, communities around the country, um, there was a lot of dereliction in 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 areas, and this was mainly due to badly maintained housing stock by the local authority um, also badly main, maintained housing stock by landlords um, and another another problem was postal discrimination so in in area in the area where i lived nearly every other house or every other third one in three houses were derelict back in in the 60s 70s and early 80s um so um with my housing journey it started in dereliction um and coming out of that um right different slide yes in the 80s and 90s onwards there became a different way of doing housing and different housing opportunity options um 
housing associations were created that came into communities like the community I lived in. Um, they came with a sweetener to say they would also bring jobs and training to the area. And in the 80s, I suppose around Margaret Thatcher's time, also the right to buy council houses um, added to the different, the different options people had for housing. Um, affordable housing became the watchword in, in the 80s. nineties and onwards. Um, housing associations um, led the way and changed really the way that housing was delivered in the UK. Um, whoops. Community-led housing. Um, my, my journey with community-led housing started around 1987 when I heard of the Zanzili project in Bristol. Um, and then I became a founder member of the community-led, community self-build agency. And, and, and what I'd like to highlight is custom builds, self-build co-ops, UK co-housing and CLTs have always existed in one form or another, but it was done by a, a more select set of people. So I think when we talk about sustainability, I think community-led housing is proving that it's sustainable in the sense of how it has grown over the last 25 years. Um, there's projects up and down the country. There's so many examples of good practice in and around the country. So community-led housing has existed. And I like this logo, this picture, you know, the importance of self-help, um, improved housing conditions, more housing, cost reduction which is something that is not marketed by the community-led housing and better quality of life. Um, my journey, my journey with community-led housing started, as I mentioned earlier, back in 1986 with the Zanzili project and seeing it on the TV, which led me, inspired me to setting up Frontline Self-Build in 1988, where a group of 12, me making 13, 12 of us, got together to build our own homes because, like I've mentioned before, um, especially for single men, um, single men, it was very hard to find accommodation um, back in the, 80, in the early 80s. Um, and the bottom picture is 25 years on, um, the houses are still there, 92,000 bricks, 52,000 blocks built by the group you see there. They built everything. They laid the foundations, they did the landscaping, they did the roofing, they did the whole nine yards. So that's where my journey within community-led housing started. In, in, I, I continued from 2000 to support um, the community self build agency nationally, lobbying gov government trying to prove that the opportunity should be given to people to try and build their own houses. In 2012, I became the Northern, the Community self build Agency's Northern Director in a voluntary capacity, which gave me a bit more backing when, when badgering my local authority. So in 2015, I was commissioned by Leeds City Council to produce a 10-year self-build and custom build strategy um, one, because we wanted to contribute to solving the housing crisis that Leeds had at the time and at that time Leeds needed to build something like 50 to 70,000 houses in the next 10 years um, so I was commissioned by the council did, did the 10-year um, strategy which to be quite honest, if I'm openly honest, is sitting in some council office gathering dust because nothing has been done with it. Um, the strategy had its targets and, and when we talk about sustainability, I think sometimes we need to not just talk about units but the other impacts we can have in communities. So within the strategy, and this is going back to 2015, um, we were looking at 400 houses 
that were either built by self-build or brought back into use. That is the empty home program. Um, seven, 700 new houses to be built by 2026. 10,000 people to visit our website. And 45% um, of the sector are self-built custom builders to receive construction training within the construction industry so they would be um, employable and, and we predicted that within that time we could get 500 long-term unemployed people off of benefit and into meaningful employment within the construction industry so when we talk about sustainability sustainability is not just about the building of the houses i don't believe it's about empowering the communities or communities more and get them employment and training um bam in leeds back one slide in leeds we have a good history of community-led housing projects in 1989 we had latch set up which is refurbishing properties empty properties they've just opened another property i think latch have been going they're still going. They've just opened another property on Friday, converted a big old house into four flats. Project in Leeds. Um, in Leeds, we're fortunate to have the Lilac project, which is like a flagship project, which <clears throat> which is talked about all over the country. That project was in 2006. And the latest contribution we have in Leeds is Chaco, Chapel Town Co-housing, which is um, a project in Leeds that is building 29 houses. Some of them are, um, are owned by the members, some of them are for rent. So Leeds has a really good history. And I, I would say with Leeds um, that this is evidence of the sustainability. The Leeds City Council as a local authority has come to the table um, and, and supported the, the, the strategy of community-led housing in Leeds, even though we still, have to, we still have problems with getting land, we still have problems with planning. At least um, we've got a positive um, council and as well, you can, you can see by the group of projects we have in Leeds, that have been going for the last 20 odd years that um, it is evidence of sustainability. Um, back to me now, I bec um, I'm a community led advisor, I'm accredited by um, the CLH. Um, I joined Leeds Community Homes as their Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Associate back in October 2019, which seems like a, a long time now. In January 2000, I became the first black male community-led advisor in the UK. Um, and then in March, we, we had shutdown. <laughs> so I've not been able to get out as much as I wanted to do and speak to groups. But in Leeds, I'm developing more groups, black and ethnic minority groups, LGBT, um, people with disability. Just to give you an idea of some of the groups I'm working with quickly, um, progress in these, I'm working with two African Caribbean groups, one that is looking at the empty homes program as their option where they would identify empty, empty properties, bring them back into use. I have another group that is looking at self-build, not sure whether they want to be a CIC or a co-op, but they're very interested. The Leeds West Indian Centre Charitable Trust is becoming interested in becoming a CLT. Um, Chapel Town Youth Development, this is an interesting one where we've got um, a, a, um, a youth development centre that has a, a load of land for playing fields and they're looking at becoming a CLT um, and also developing more sports activity on their site as well as some housing. We have Legacy Housing Association of Women are interested in co-housing and self-build, an Asia group that we're working with now. Um, and, and there's been some good benefits. We're working now on speaking with um, the Refugee Education and Training Advice Center, retasked for sure. 
We're in early discussions about documented people who have migrated here, who have got big housing issues, um, refurbishing empty homes. In Leeds, we have a, the Leeds Migration Partnership, which is working with asylum seekers and the homeless. So for example, we're looking at how we can have an involvement in trying to solve the homeless issue we have. Oh, uh, um, that's, that's just a message that came through. Um, yes, um, we're working with uh, and looking at homelessness within Leeds and whether the community-led sector can actually be a leader in helping solve homelessness um, within the city. And, and we're looking beyond COVID, we can work with Leeds City Council and the other partners. Um, I'm also supporting a, um, an LGBT group, um, Freedom, who are looking at creating a housing cooperative and supporting Cragside, which is another project in Leeds. So as you can see, there's even within the black and ethnic minority, there is quite a lot of action, a lot of people interested in being part of the sector. Um, I am also um, in looking at um, doing some BME research into the community-led sector, along with a, a friend I've got in Nottingham from Pathway Solutions, Henry Baptiste. And what we've realized is that there are not many black-led housing projects in the system. And we're wanting to research why that is. And we're very much looking at putting equality, diversity, and inclusion at the heart of the community led housing sector, because we believe that will add to the sustainability if we bring in new people, new groups to the sector. So we're um, looking into doing that research. And within that research, the aims of the proposal are to explore and explain barriers operating within the housing sector um, to support BME-led organisations more active in the sector, to promote good practice and methods and opportunities. Key objectives to examine, as I've mentioned, the structural barriers for BME-led organisations, review organisational approaches. So we want to look at the, 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 the community-led housing sector but we also want to look out how the community-led housing sector is funded. Um, we want to look at how um, Homes England distributes its funding, because I do believe a sustainable way of supporting, this, of supporting the sector is to ring fence funding. So Homes England ring fence an amount of money that can go to community-led um, sector. And I do believe within local authorities, we, the local authorities need to be doing the same thing. That is ring fencing. I think that's the only way the sector can be sustained. If all powers that be appreciate ring fencing. Um, we want to re review and the take up of community led housing models and definitions. We want to look into why I did my project over 20 years ago, why it's really a small amount of black and ethnic minority people um, are getting into the sector. Again, highlight good practices, examples, develop these case studies for dissemination. We also want to create a equality, diversity and inclusion toolkit for the sector. So whether you are a rural group or you're an urban group, you have equality, diversity, embedded in, 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 your, in your movement forward. Um, scope future funding with the sector for implementation and action. I know I'm running out of time. Um, so, and, this, and there's nine stages, doing the scoping, um, policy and strategy review, review, practical survey, quantitative feedback, gap analysis, recommendations and consult, for cons, consultation, action planning, research report and action planning and a stage two which would be look at how we implement that and within that again we would like to see that EDI, EDL, EDI sorry, um, toolkit created so that the sector have something that they can 
benchmark themselves against because I do believe going forward funders or potential funders will want to see evidence that you are looking at equality diversity and inclusion Woo. Um, thank you and I will take questions at the end I hope that wasn't over my time team um, and thank you very much thanks so much you actually Oh. You're actually per perfectly on time there. Um, okay, so our second speaker today um, is Tim from Wessex Community Assets. So Wessex Community Assets is act as an incubator for a number of key housing innovation schemes in the Devon, Dorset and Somerset area, including the development of one of the UK's largest enabling services for community-led housing. Um, I know Tim's current focus is the Roof Project, which is a partnership working with Humble Architects and Roof is seeking to change the way we build affordable housing and consider how it can be made more efficient, less damaging to the environment and have positive social impact. So yeah, I'm really keen to hear more about uh, the project from Tim. I think he's got a very holistic view on all of these issues. Um, so yeah, if we could share Tim's slides um, and then take it away. Thanks, Tim. Great. Thanks, Philippa. Um, can you hear me? Just to check. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so I work for a social enterprise called Wessex Community Assets. So I'll explain a bit more about that. Um, I'm also doing a part-time PhD at Plymouth University and today I'm going to talk about a particular project that I'm working on that relates to that PhD. I'm not going to talk about um, methodology and literature and all that sort of stuff but if anybody has any questions later I'm happy to, to answer those. Um, so a bit of background on Wessex Community Assets. So we were set up uh, with a couple of sister organisations about 20 years ago. Um, a group of us came together, we worked for various community enterprises and social enterprises and we recognised for, for the projects that we were working on, uh, we all needed access to land and finance and it kind of made sense to set up a secondary organisation that could help us to do that. Um, so in terms of community housing, we've been working on this uh, since 2001 across three counties, so Devon, Dorset and Somerset, and we've effectively developed a, a hub. We've, we've been running a hub, I suppose, for the last 15 years at least. Um, in the latest phase, um, we've completed 22 projects over the last seven or eight years, and we've got another 50 in progress. Um, we've just shifted that, most some of that service over into a new community interest company that sits alongside Wessex. Um, but just to say something about those projects, so in the first phase, we uh, tended to work with standalone projects. Um, for example, High Bickington was a, um, the, a county farm that the County Council um, made available for housing development and a community land trust was set up and they were involved in about 50 houses. Um, the project took about 10 or 12 years and many other projects that we work with also took a long time. So we've all, always been thinking how do we speed up the process um, of uh, getting community housing going. So over the last 10 years um, there's been a particular focus on partnerships with housing associations um, and that's sped up the process but it causes its own issues as well so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, these are some of the community land trusts we've helped set up and these are some of the housing associations that we've been working with over the last few years and this is the kind of geographical terrain that we work across across the three counties and the projects we're working on. Um, a very small number of the projects that we've supported have had a, a kind of a real explicit focus on sustainability issues. So for example, uh, Christo, the Community Land Trust, worked with teen housing um, on a project in the Dartmoor National Park to build 18 passive house 
affordable homes, but this is one of the very few projects that has managed to really prioritise ecological issues. And this was a real kind of concern that we wanted to address through the Raise the Roof project. So um, the Raise the Roof project is kind of basically saying there are four overlapping issues um, that we need to deal with. So clearly there's a housing crisis, there's an ecological and climate crisis, but actually there's also crises around local economies and employment. And I think there's also issues around uh, participation and democracy, particularly economic democracy. And we're very interested in how do you tie those things together. So just very briefly, I think uh, around the housing crisis, I think we have to be realistic and say that community led housing is currently delivering only limited numbers of houses um, in a context where, you know, eight to 10 big developers uh, deliver most housing in this country, unlike many other countries. So how do we shift that? Um, I think when you look at the community led housing sector across the last 10 years or so, um, many organizations have joined up with housing associations but I think the problem there is that then the capacity of the community-led housing sector is not being strengthened. So that needs to be addressed. Um, in terms of ecological and climate crisis, you know, we face um, constraints, particularly on the financial side, I guess, but um, also in terms of uh, constraints around designs and the materials that we have available. So how do we address that? And then finally, around local economies and jobs, you know, we, we have a housing development in Bridport about to start, 760 houses are going to be built. It's going to make very little difference to the local economy or job creation uh, around the town where I live. So how do we do better in that context? So those are the kind of issues that we're trying to address through Raise the Roof. Okay, so um, about four years ago, uh, as a kind of beginning of this process, we were commissioned um, by the local community council, who had some lottery funding, uh, to do a report on the potential use of local materials in construction. Um, and we had a particular interest in the use of timber and other local materials. And the town where I live, Bridport, it actually developed a few hundred years ago around the making of rope and net and the raw material for those were uh, hemp and flax and so we became very interested in whether we could link together timber uh, with the use of hemp or particularly hempcrete uh, in the the making of affordable housing so hemp is a really interesting crop i won't go into it but it's uh, it sequesters carbon much faster than uh, trees. Uh, it has this amazing woody core that can be mixed with lime to make hempcrete. Um, so we're very interested in that as a, as a future material. And so what we're trying to do is to say, okay, we need affordable housing. We need that housing to be sustainable. Therefore, we need, need to make a connection between housing and regenerative agriculture and regenerative tree. But to make that happen, there has to be something in the middle, which is uh, infrastructure for local processing, those materials and infrastructure for manufacturing using methods of construction. And that's what we're trying to explore through the Raise the Roof project. So after the research that we did with the Community Council, we brought together uh, a partnership of different organisations uh, we're very lucky that the picture in the middle is um, some student housing which was designed and built by students of the Architectural Association which has a timber mill college just up uh, from where I live. Um, so that's been an inspiration for us but there are many other organisations locally that we're interested in the issue of sustainable housing. Um, so we got some funding from the Arts Council um, to work with Assemble so Assemble, they're, they're quite an interesting uh, group of architects. They worked with the Granby Four Streets Community Land Trust in Liverpool on a refurbishment 
and they set up a workshop called Granby Workshop uh, where they make items for the interiors of the housing and created local jobs and for that they won the Turner Contemporary Art Prize. Um, so we were, they approached us but we were also interested in how we could work with Assemble. So uh, with that initial bit of funding they came up with various propositions um, for housing that could be built uh, in Dorset, where we where we live, um, and started work on designs for the actual construction approaches using local materials. Um, so, in particular, as I say, using hempcrete um, and timber. And we've been, as a result of that, looking at examples around uh, Europe, in particular, uh, where they're already making uh, timber hempcrete panels. Uh, they do this off-site, they're prefabricated and then put together very quickly on site. So this is the kind of infrastructure that we're uh, looking to put together. We're very interested, um, some of you might know uh, WikiHouse um, or Mass Bespoke, uh, which is a, a, a Leeds-based uh, system of uh, sort of digital design and fabrication. And so we're very interested in the, uh, how do you ensure that this shift to modern methods of construction, which is underway, doesn't just end up with vast centralised manufacturing plants in the middle of the country? How do you get a much more distributed approach so that in Bridport, for example, where I live, we can uh, work with a network of local fabricators to produce the materials for uh, for buildings. So as I say, um, this kind of shift to um, modern methods of construction and distributed fabrication kind of sits on a spectrum. So at one end you have things like WikiHouse, um, where they use CNC machines to cut out uh, the parts from plywood and put them together. Uh, or this is an example in Wales, uh, which is a kind of much more low tech version where they just uh, hired a, a local empty farm building as their site fabrication facility and, and that's actually what we're uh, looking at doing uh, in Bridport. So we're working with the local farmer, he has a, a barn that's becoming uh, redundant. We've already worked there, um, we, we ran a training course to employ people last autumn uh, making a tiny house and we're now looking at uh, developing a wood hub for off-site fabrication. Um, so that wood hub will have three elements. Um, the first element is around the processing of the materials and then the manufacture of the construction components. The second element is around skills training and then to make the thing viable we'll also have a workspace to rent to other contractors and carpenters. So this is the kind of setup. Um, I'm involved in a social enterprise down in Devon uh, called The Woodland Presents, and we've already uh, created a, a timber fabrication space called The Wood Lab, which has just opened. Um, we've also just got funding. Um, so as I said, I'm doing a PhD uh, part-time with Plymouth University at the moment, and we just secured funding from EPSRC uh, a program called Connected Everything. So this is to do with uh, digital design and fabrication. And we're going to be working with the uh, digital fabrication lab at the university, and then working with some partners like uh, Automated Architecture, and also We Can Make up in uh, Null West, uh, again, to explore the potential for digital design and, and fabrication linked to the use of local materials. So we have a number of uh, practical projects um, that we're developing. We're working with the town council and the museum on a storage building where we'll be able to test out um, the hempcrete and timber panels. Um, we're working with Assemble on designs for a pilot terrace of five houses, uh, which would be done on a self-finish basis, and that may be something we can talk about in the discussion, the difference between complete self-build and uh, a shift towards self-finish, uh, where the structure is fabricated off-site and put together 
quite quickly. So you have a watertight building, but then the prospective tenants then work more on the, the insides of the buildings. And then, uh, like many towns, we have a big development uh, about to take place next year, uh, Via's Farm, and the master plan is indicating the potential for 50 community-led houses. So we're looking to take on uh, those plots and, and develop 50 houses using the designs and the fabrication uh, approaches that we're developing. Uh, we have a set of questions. I, I, I presume the slides will be circulated. So in this raise the roof um, research that we're doing, this action research that we're doing, clearly we have a number of questions that we're exploring in a very practical way. So these are the key questions that we're, we're exploring. Um, and yeah, but very quickly, again, I don't have time to go through this, but essentially what we need, we need physical platforms, the kind of physical infrastructure uh, within the local economy, R really important to integrate this with training. And then we need the digital platforms, one around materials and one around design uh, to make this happen. And so, uh, yeah, just to finish, uh, clearly we're in within this action research program it's quite a complex um, process it would be very e easy to kind of create a kind of simplistic theory of change that says we start here there's a linear process and we'll end up here but actually uh, there are all these different elements that we need to explore and yeah it will be interesting where we end up in the next couple of years uh, and that's I won't go into these last ones because of time, but um, that's more to do with my PhD. So I think I'll I'll end here, and if there's questions, then I can come back to this later. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, we will have um, quite a bit of time for questions, I think. So um, yeah, that's brilliant. So our final speaker is uh, Kat Quigley. CAT is part of the Oakfield project, which is a housing project developed nationwide. Oakfield is a 239 uh, unit housing development and it's been developed on a not-for-profit basis. So I'm really interested in this because the bio says it aims to trial new ways of building uh, with a focus on community and sustainability and I'm interested in the scale. I think um, a lot of housing projects that are doing things differently sometimes struggle to come up with this kind of scale. So, yeah, I think it would be great to hear from Kat. Um, if we could have her slides, please. Hi, uh, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, thank you. Um, I still find it quite strange talking to a screen with no people. Um, so if you get bored, you can't hear me or anything else, just pop something in chat. Um, Tim and Claude, it's been absolutely fascinating listening to both of your stories. I'd love to pick up with um, both of you afterwards, actually. Um, so, yeah, Oakfield is a not-for-profit scheme, um, which is led by Nationwide Building Society. Um, and it's really based on our kind of strong uh, principles around mutual um, good or mutuality and social purpose. So I thought I'd do a quick history lesson, if that's all right, um, for anybody who doesn't know um, about um, building societies, bear with me and I'll get back to present day. Um, so I thought if we can kind of take our minds to 1775 um, to a pub, because I thought a pub story is always good, isn't it? Ne nearly at that time at the end of the day. Um, so, so the story goes, um, regulars to the Golden Cross in um, somewhere in Birmingham, we decided to come together and every Friday they would pull some of their wages, penny in the pint pot, and they would share that out until one by one they each had homes of their own. I think that was you know, a really early um, example of people coming together to do more than they, they can achieve on their own. And that movement began to spread across the country. And then the four parents to Nationwide came into being, I think sometime around 1884, which was the beginning of what we now know as Nationwide Building Society. 
Um, we continued our support um, for housing um, across the 19th, 20th century. We were really active uh, after both the world wars. Um, we supported builder schemes. Um, Claude, it's really interesting to hear some of the things you were saying about self-build. I know we supported a lot of that after the Second World War and there's um, a name I've got in my head and I've tried to find out more about it while we've been talking and I haven't had a reply yet, but um, there's something um, we supported um, called the 50 Men of Brum, which was a big self-build scheme after the Second World War. I'm going to try and find out um, more about that because I'm interested now. Um, and then, of course, we went on to support Letchworth, which we all know is the first garden city. Um, and this other picture on my slide is um, around some urban regeneration that we supported um, in the 1980s. Um, so bringing us on a little bit then, I just thought it would be useful um, to explain we're not a bank we're a building society we are owned by our members we don't have shareholders um, and in 2006 our members voted that we should spend one percent of our pre-tax profits every year on doing social good i wanted to mention at this point actually um the nationwide foundation who tim and claude i know you both um both know so they are a separate um charity um, separate to us both funded by us and they have a very similar vision um, they are huge advocates for community-led housing they do a lot in the affordable housing space, space and have funded and be part of the affordable housing commission um, led by lord um, best and i know they've also funded the we can make project at Knoll west that you just mentioned um, as well tim so um, we kind of given a mandate by our membership um, to follow that social purpose and invest money in doing social good and we had um, quite a wide um, spectrum I guess of things that we were supporting initially everything from kind of financial um, education um, to supporting the most vulnerable in our society and in 2006 um, I had a really lovely project actually we decided we probably needed to focus narrow our focus um, a little bit. So I spent the year working with our members, asking them what they wanted us to focus on and overwhelmingly housing. They felt that um, with Nationwide's background, I think we have a relationship with one in four homes through mortgages or savings. Um, and they felt really strongly that we should be doing all that we can be to tackling um, the housing crisis in the UK. Um, so our current strategy um, an investment team which is focused all around um, you know the belief that everyone should have a place fit to call home was born and we focus on uh, a number of programs so we have a really strong and enduring relationship with shelter it's our 20th year this year with St Mungo's we have a community grants program where over five years we are granting 22 million pounds to housing um, groups across the UK um, in including community-led groups. Applications for that are open at the moment, so I will just drop um, links to that um, into the chat afterwards in case it's of interest to anybody. So organisations can apply for grants of up to £50,000. And then that takes us on to Oakfield. So thank you for bearing with me on that. I felt it was kind of important to share some of our heritage and why the still purpose is so kind of strong and part of, of what we're doing. Um, so let me talk a little bit about Oakfield now. Um, I don't know if there's um, any nationwide members um, listening. To so we have a strap line which is building society nationwide. Um, in many ways we are building society. And then I think there became a conversation of, oh, but should we actually be building society? Maybe we need to have a look at, um, you know, some bricks and mortar. So as I said at the beginning, Oakfield is a, a not-for-profit um, project. Um, we very much see it as a test and learn and we very much see it as an opportunity to share what we're learning, to widen that debate about how um, other responsible businesses who you know, don't have building as their core business, for example, could get involved um, in increasing supply, what we can learn around sustainability, what we can learn around um, community and so on. Um, we're really open about what we're learning. Um, I obviously won't be able to cover it all today, but if anybody has um, particular questions, um, do let me know in the Q&A or follow it up um, afterwards. You know, we're not the experts. Um, we are learning and we're guided by some fantastic experts. So Igloo Regeneration, who are a B Corp, or our development manager, and 
kind of hand holding us through this and we've got a raft of amazing architects and every other um, type of company that I never knew was needed on a on a on a housing scheme and um, we've been guided by some really strong principles throughout the project and I wanted to touch on three of those quickly but I thought I'd just give you um share with you some pictures of what the scheme looks like so I think it always helps um to see doesn't it so oh I keep pressing the wrong button <laughs> for some reason it doesn't make the slides on here again um so as Philip has said it's 239 homes that we're building in the east of Swindon which is close to our headquarters 30% of those will be affordable housing. There's a big focus. You can see here some of the shared spaces, lots of spaces for community, the community to meet inside and outside. This is our um, community hub building. So on the bottom, there's indoor community space, and then there's apartments on top. We've become really interested in some thinking around intergenerational living and how we can encourage older and younger generations to live side by side and it was actually um, suggestions that came out of the community consultation which I'll talk about a bit in a moment so the plan is in these apartments um, for key workers and older people to live um, as well as these um, apartment walk-up apartments we call them here as well so you'd have um, a key worker and um, key worker on the first floor um, and an older person on the ground floor um, and you'll note the doors side by side to encourage neighbourliness. So just um, wanted to go back um, to some of those guiding principles which I think has been really important to us um, as a programme, the seven, I won't, I won't talk through all of them. Um, so community I think has been at the heart of our project from the get-go um, we've had, I think, a quite a unique approach to the planning process. So we hired Keith Brown, um, a community organiser, who I wish I was able to play a video, but I know it doesn't work particularly well um, on this platform because he was such a personality. Um, he's been an amazing part of this project. And he literally, for 18 months before we even put the planning application together, knocked on doors of the communities um, around our brownfield site they're quite diverse communities um, and he would you know get to know people in the queue for the fish and chip shop or he'd go to coffee mornings he got to know the churches the schools and really what we saw was he was kind of tapping into people in the community who would never normally come along to a kind of typical consultation planning consultation event people who felt like they wouldn't be listened to because they lived in um, in council housing or people who just felt their opinion didn't matter and I think that's been so in, important to us to have that really wide cross-section of the community who've been who've been involved in this who've shared you know their hopes and aspirations for the area and specifically for Oakfield as a neighborhood and we've really been able to build that design by Keith sharing those views by people coming along and getting to know us and our architects and the project team so that we could define what the neighbourhood has to offer, not just for the new residents, but for the people who will continue to, to live around it. Um, and community, you know, has been really important in the planning stages. And I think that, you know, continues and will be a massive theme for us going forward. Um, obviously, um, you know, finding ourselves in the midst of the pan pandemic last year, um, we were able to set up a fund. So we um, were able to offer £100,000 to the local community, to the grassroots um, and charity organisations to support the people who needed it most. I think that's just come to an end. I think in the last few days, we've um, been working in partnership with the Wiltshire Community Foundation and we've, I think, just funded the last group. So we funded about 22 or 24 um, different community groups to support people with different housing needs. Um, in the local area which has been really important um, we are focused on how we can be a good neighbor during the construction phase we realize that having a building site um, in your backyard for two or three years um, you know does come with some with some things that we need to be really considerate about and there's some good learnings for us there um, Keith has left a real legacy in the community um, he got to know a group of really passionate women who were really focused on 
um, using their words, putting the heart back in the community. Um, he's uh, trained them up. They're a constituted group um, of community organisers, and they're now starting to look at social action projects that they can work on in the area as well, which is um, yeah, just one of my favourite bits. And then we will start to turn our attention to um, the thriving community that will move into these homes. So we're in the construction phase at the moment with the first homes being ready for people to move in early next year. And I'm starting to look at how we can really support that thriving community to mesh with the existing um, communities around it, how we can look at um, that intergenerational piece that I've talked about, how we can look at kind of health and well-being and how we can look at sustainable living as well which brings me on to kind of sustainability and the green um, point I think being really open and for a learning for us sustainability wasn't as high up on our agenda when the project was incepted as it is now and I think um, you know absolutely rightly so we're all realizing how much we need to look at the green agenda and do more and do it much more quickly um, nationwide in general is really committed to the green agenda and is, um, is making huge strides in that specifically around retrofit um, with more to come I think but it felt absolutely right that we needed to do more than the original design and spec for Oakfield um, so Oakfield is going to be completely off gas we're using air source heat pumps we've got solar panels even on the apartments um, which I understand isn't always the easiest thing to do um, we've got e-bike chargers in all the gardens and bike sheds and we've got um, electric vehicle, um, so car chargers um, across the development and wired ready for people to put their ones into their homes. Um, so in energy efficiency, um, our um, expectation is that all of the homes will be EPCA rated, uh, which I think if we were starting from scratch, we would have approached the sustainability um, Side of it from a from a from a different perspective, but I think where we've got to now, I think is is a, is a re really good thing for the project, and I'm really delighted that that's something that we've been able to push forward. Um, so the last thing I just wanted to talk about really was this um, sort of view of how we can share learnings to encourage others to do more. Um, we're you know absolutely not the experts in this, and we're learning as we go. Along. I, um, fully aware that I'm in a room of experts, so I'll be delighted to hear what you all think about our scheme. And so, uh, we another one with a focus on sustainability and affordability. And um, if um, any of you have any views or ideas on that, then I'd um, be delighted to hear from you, please. Um, these little images here actually are booklets that we produced before. <laughs> to wave. Um, so this is just really kind of sharing our, our learnings as we go to promote discussion, to encourage, you know, other responsible businesses um, to do more. So the first one um, we shared at a reception at the House of Lords last year that Lord Best kindly hosted for us. Um, this second one is around our approach to community involvement. We'll be doing one talking about our learnings about green. We'll be doing one about some of the things that we've noticed during the construction phase and how we think there could be some improvements there. We'll be doing lots on community formation. Um, so it's not to say um, that we know everything, it's to say that we're, we're really committed to this space and we're really you know, willing to be part of that debate, to learn from others, but also to share what we're learning. Um, we've spoken to other building societies who've been interested, um, some other corporates who you know, perhaps have some cash on their balance sheets who are thinking that they too also have a really strong social purpose and perhaps should be doing something um, in this space. So I think um, you know, for us, the innovation really is about how can we encourage those already not in the sector to look at you know, that responsible increase in supply. I think that's it for me. I'll hand back to you, Philippa. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so we have some questions. Um, if anyone would like to put more questions in the chat or if you would like to raise your hand to make a comment, um, that would be great. Um, is Claude, are you here at the moment? I think Claude might have had some trouble um, with connection. So, oh, 
Yeah, I think, yeah, he's here. Great. Okay, so the first question um, is for you, Claude, and it's from Caroline. Um, she says, as far as she's known so far, most co-housing schemes are quite middle class and white, except for Chapel Town. Um, is your upcoming project going to consider co-housing at all and um, in that sense? Is that is that question for me? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, none of the different um, strands are off the table. So co-housing, yes. Um, Self-build, yes. Um, empty homes, yes. So yes, I would consider all all options. Great. Okay, uh, Tim. Um, yeah, just to mention a, a co-housing scheme in Bridport, which is on site at the moment. Um, so it's an it's an affordable self uh, an affordable co-housing scheme, which is is quite unusual. Um, I mean, co-housing kind of originally developed in Denmark, and then I think in the Netherlands, and. I think the initial schemes were older people who were looking to kind of downsize. Um, so they then sold their houses, pooled the funds and were then able to develop houses that were more appropriate to their their needs as older people. Um, so the initial co-housing projects in this country kind of followed that line. So they, they weren't affordable. Um, the Pripple one, I think, is quite interesting because it's 53 houses and they're working with Bournemouth Church's Housing Association. Um, so it is affordable. Um, the challenge, and it's a challenge for most co-housing projects, is that the funding that Bournemouth Church's Housing Association is able to draw down from Homes England doesn't cover the common house. And yet in a co-housing development, the common house is sort of essential really, because people, the idea is that you have slightly smaller houses, you may not have shared facilities um, and you need to have a space where everyone in the co-housing uh, group can meet up, say once a week or once a month for meals. And so the group is having to fund the common house separately through a community share offer. So that's going to be quite a challenge because they're obviously then going to have to pay back both interest and the capital that they they raise. Um, so it does present a problem for when you're trying to do an affordable co-housing project, but at least they are kind of pioneering. So I think it's, it's quite an interesting project to look at. Oh, great, that's really helpful. So the next question um, is for Tim, but I think it's also maybe Claude, you might have something to say on this. Um, Will's asked, he hasn't come across self-finished housing before, and it'd be great to hear more about what the benefits of self-finish is and versus perhaps self-build or what the benefits of doing either are and what the trade-offs are um, compared to other ways of developing housing. Um, my understanding of um, self-finishing is that the bulk of the work is done by a contractor. The contractor comes in and delivers the bulk of the work, maybe first fitting, second fitting, and you do the finishing. So whether it's electrics or, I mean, whether it's painting and decorating, you may do the actual finishing bits. If it's a timber frame, you may do the brick cladding. Um, so yeah, the self-finishing is another option. Um, I have come across it, um, so again the groups that i've known they've done the landscaping and that finishing part of the house um i don't know was it cat that mentioned it i think it was cat that really mentioned who mentioned the self finishing then if it wasn't you cat sorry oh, i think uh, it sorry. was yeah it was tim. sorry tim that's all right yeah i mean um Okay, self-finish. So uh, there are some quite interesting examples. For example, Bristol Community Land Trust, um, their first development um, included a, a sort of self-finish refurbishment of a, 
uh, an old school building. Um, so as Claude said, you know, contractors were built, uh, brought in to do the initial stages and then people work. Um, that's one that's one approach to self finish. I think from our point of view, um, I think there's a number of reasons why we're interested. I think the first one is that it's clear that over the next 10 years, the construction industry has got to change. There will be a shift to modern methods of construction. It's not going to happen overnight, um, partly because the the infrastructure isn't in place and partly because the the skills aren't there but but it will we we will see that shift to off-site fabrication no doubt and i think the potential benefit to community housing projects is um where for example there was a self-build project in devon um called broad hempston and they went down a timber frame with straw bale route and they originally thought that the houses were going to cost them about a hundred thousand um, and it would take about a year to construct but in the end it took two years to build the houses and cost them about 180,000 so they had they didn't have sufficient control over the costs and so the the benefit of a self-finish approach linked to off-site prefabrication is a that you can be much clearer about um, you know the potential cost of the build you can be much clearer about the time scale it can be done much uh, quicker and I think it also relates to um, the challenges of getting say a group mortgage on a, um, a self-finished scheme in that once you've got a watertight structure you can get cheaper finance for the next stage of development and so the quicker you can get that structure up and watertight the more cost effective it's going to be and so that's another reason i think why there is going to be this shift to a self-finish approach i think also um, for those people that want to work in the industry self-build can be a good route to get those skills and then to move on but for a lot of people they see self-build or self-finish as a route to putting in sweat equity into a house that they can then to make it more affordable and they're not interested in then going on and you know uh, working in the industry so again self-finish for them because they get a house quicker and they can also focus on you know the sort of the internal finishing the furniture etc so i think for lots of reasons um it's the way the industry is going but i think in terms of community-led housing i think it also makes a lot of sense to shift from self build to self finish that's great thank you um so a question for you kat um so do you think that what we've seen at Oakfield, what you've seen at Oakfield could be scaled up beyond the single development scale? Um, what do you think the lessons are for other developers? What would need to change if it was? Lovely question, thank you. Yeah, I think you know our in intention has always been that we'd hope for it to be scaled and there's definitely elements that we'd share, I think, We've moved away now from thinking that we've created a blueprint that people would just, you know, pick up and put somewhere else. And I think that's been part of our learning of, you know, what's important to the community that you're building in, part in that area, and how do you really involve them in the process? So I think there's elements of replicability or scalability in terms of the learnings of the, for the approach that we've taken. Um, what was the second part of the question, Philippa? Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, just um, what needs to change for these to become normal practice? Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, you know, there's been some learnings for us, things like you need to find a good council to work with or a good local authority, um, price of, la of the land, um, you know, timings around when you're doing things. Um, I think there are lots of things that we've learned that we would definitely share with anybody else who was, you know, thinking about it. None of those things are insurmountable, but, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? 
Yeah, that's great. That's really helpful. Um, Claude, we've got two questions for you. So the first is, what was your experience with housing for people with disabilities, um, and, you know, as an EDI advisor? And the second is from Rhiannon, who says, um, you mentioned that Leeds Council supports the projects you're working with. Could you talk some more about how that partnership works and if there are challenges? So about disability and about the role of Leeds Community Council. Thanks. Okay. Um, the disability one, um, when I originally came back to the sector three years ago, um, I was the BAME and LGBT advisor. And I quickly realized that um, they were not looking at disability. So what I did, I became equality, diversity and inclusion because we really need to look in and embed that nobody in and around our projects gets left out, gets excluded. So the disability thing came in and um, what it was, was um, most groups they don't look at that and, and it really needs to be looked at. We really need to be looking at when we're planning our projects that we're giving everybody an equal opportunity of being in that project. Somebody may have a partner that's in a wheelchair, for example. So, you know, are the door sizes that we're setting up when we're building our houses, do they allow wheelchairs to get in and out of the houses and stuff like that? You know, so with, with disabilities, I realized it was something that needed beefing up. So I've started the discussion. And when, when, I, when I talk about equality, diversity and inclusion, I'm looking at the nine characteristics that are written in, um, in the equal opportunities to ensure, and, and that's something I'm hoping with the research we do, we're gonna embed that everybody, regardless if they've got any people with disabilities in your you should be taking that as you should still be looking into how you could engage them we should with our projects we want to show inclusive that we're inclusive even if we don't have anybody that is ethnic minority or anybody that's lgbt or, or a woman that's fleeing violence we should still look at all of them strands when we're designing our projects so I hope, Abraham, that answers your question. Uh, people with disabilities have kind of been left out, but I'm trying to flag up that, that, that um, bring up that bridge and say everybody should look at it. Um, Hannah, um, I mentioned Leeds City Council has been supportive, but there's a reality here. The reality is that no matter who you, you, no matter who you are, or no matter what group, even if you're a private developer, when you get to the council, you still have to go through their um, planning permit, planning department. You still have to identify the land. So that doesn't change, and that can still be what slows you down. You know, let's be honest, when you get into a community-led housing project, it doesn't happen in 18 months. It can be a lead-in of maybe three years, four years, um, and you need the local authority to work with you along that journey. We was, I was fortunate that we had individuals within the local authority that had a little bit of knowledge about community-led housing, and that helped. Um, one of the proposals we're putting as well within, within our research is that there needs to be more training done with staff of local authority housing departments so they understand what community-led housing is. And we also need to be doing training for staff of housing associations so they understand what we're actually bringing to the table. Um, as far as partnerships are concerned, we had a good housing association and, and, and it was the director of housing and the director of the housing association that was supportive of our project. So if you can get local support from your councillors or your local MP quite high up within the local authority, that's the best way to go forward. It's nice that officers um, are sympathetic to your cause, 
but you really need the support of a little higher than that councillors, MPs to be supportive. Um, so yeah, so developing partnerships, it's about trying to lead individuals within them organisations around the table. That's great. Thanks so much. So I'm going to, we've got one more question for Kat and then we've got three quite meaty questions for everyone on the panel. Um, so if we go with this uh, question for Kat and then we can close, um, look at each of those questions in turn. Um, Kat, I was just, uh, we've had a question about what's the tenure mix at Oakfield and how do you sort of approach the problems of affordability in terms of who can buy a home, what kind of renting is available, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that's a really good um, question for us. And I think, if I'm honest, there's been some real learnings for us around affordability. Um, so 30% of our homes will be sort of capital A affordable housing, um, which meets the standard set by our borough council. And that will be a mix of affordable rent and shared ownership. I think at the sort of early days of this project, that felt like we were doing a good thing and we were told that you know, developers very rarely kind of meet that standard. I think it's become, you know, quite clear to us as that's um, progressed that actually we need to be looking at that kind of actual definition of, you know, true affordability set out by the Housing Commission. I think for a future scheme, absolutely, with that challenge, truly affordable, sustainable homes. I think. In the meantime, um, on Oakfield, we feel like we have got a good mix. We've got one, two, three, and four beds. We've got you know that mix of um, the intergenerational through our affordable housing, um, and nationwide more broadly is looking at um, what we can do in terms of mortgages. They've recently we have recently um, launched a helping hand mortgage, which is a 95% mortgage with a higher um, loan to value. Um, ratio on it. So I think from from that perspective, we're we're looking at what we can do um, to support kind of around deposits um, and affordability from that side. But I think it's a really valid question and something that we would want to do more on in future projects. Great. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, the gap between affordable A and affordable yeah. B is quite quite severe in some cases so it's a really interesting area okay so neil's question i'm going to try and get this right um what i guess this is about what would your ideal imaginative collaborative housing project look like what would be your um what would be the most important things to take through what would you do if you could do anything i guess if we were working on a project together yeah <laughs> what an amazing idea I love that <laughs> I think well I'll, I'll jump in and start so a real problem that we've got in this country is that local authorities don't have the power to purchase land at agricultural value and you know we do in rural areas have rural exception sites where the price of agricultural land is at least depressed but for the majority of sites they have to be bought at um, so-called market value and that immediately makes the majority of the housing on that site unaffordable so i think there's if you look on you know, in Europe at the housing sort of situation in Europe, it's those countries where governments have given local authorities the power to buy agricultural land, at agricultural value, because you can you can buy an acre of agricultural land for £10,000. But as soon as it's got planning permission for housing, it's a million pounds. So yeah. that, you know, that has to then be be covered. I mean, the site um, for these 760 is in Bridport that's just been bought by Barrett's for 24 million. Um, so that 24 million is then going to go into the final cost of the houses. So that's the first partnership. We need a government that is prepared to 
you know, legislate so that local authorities can become proper partners. So I'll throw that in as a beginning. Yeah. Um, on, on, on the collaboration, I would have said that community-led housing, whether it's CLT under CLTs, whether it's co-housing, whether it's um, cooperatives, is very much about trying to bring individuals together to try and um, change the way housing is delivered. I take, I take um, Tim's, Tim's view. Until we've got um, local authorities and government that look at land differently um, and see the long-term benefits, because sometimes when you think about the housing, the housing stock that we have now, some of the housing stock we have now was built like 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. And it is, you know, I, I often say when the government talks about investment in infrastructure in the UK, they need to also be talking about housing because it's, it's, it's an infrastructure investment that is going to last beyond the person that lives in the house. So um, I do think that um, the way land is, the value is put on land and what is market value and isn't market value, it, 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 it's not a red herring, but it, 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 what it serves to do, it serves to keep this um, marketplace where the supply and demand is not balanced because the, the real value on property is about supply and demand. If there's, if there's a lot of demand for housing, then the value of housing goes up. And, and we have, and, and in, in Britain, we need to redress it a bit like Tim was saying, how Europe, certain parts of Europe look at land, Norway and Sweden, how they see that actually investment in housing stock is actually investment in your people. Um, and not not for just gain. Um, I remember when we was doing our project and um, we had an issue with um, getting some, un some money to um, underpin it. And the reality was that the houses will be built and somebody will be collecting rent on them properties for the next, if they're built well and maintained, for the next 100 years. So you know it, it's a bit of a red herring i feel this value um market value it suits those who are in positions who have housing to say that um so that's that's my take on it i think that um really you know britain really needs to be looking at investment in communities and investment in people rather than just thinking about everything as a unit and, and, and cost. And, and I take Tim's point, um, but I do believe we're winning the fight. I do believe community-led housing, what is happening in the sector is, is will, will change. Because I look back 25 years ago, and 25 years ago, the people that were doing community-led housing, the people that were doing self build the people that were doing co-housing, we're a very small group of people now we're offering it we're looking to open it out and i think um we have to think positively um things will change and will change for the better that's my take on it i think i agree with um everything that claude and tim have said but you know i just think oh what a lovely daydream i'm having in my head now of you know the things that um i think we could learn um from both tim and, and claude and the, the projects that you're, you're working on and you know as i said it's sort of really early early days for us and we are we are learning as we go but i think you know claude absolutely the equality piece should be much more kind of front and center for us and tim i've just been looking back at your lovely circular diagram of forestry and industry and um, affordable housing and I just think that that's such a lovely thought for us to consider for future projects but that kind of broader circular piece rather than just the homes I think we've we've done a lot around the community but I think the, the picture has to be bigger doesn't it in terms of 
how it's made and who, who you can support in terms of jobs and then how you help those communities continue to thrive and that, that's the really important thing I think to Phil's point it's not it's not a house it's a unit it's it's a home and it's part of a community and that that's what binds us all together. Ah, oh, that's great thank you so much um, I think we'll actually finish there um, yeah, I just want to say thank you very much to all of the speakers. Um, I really learned a lot today. And thank you everyone for attending. Um, there will be a recording and um, at least some of the slides will be going out to the attendees. Um, hopefully everyone's had ample opportunity to get hold of various people's um, Twitter handles and things like that. But if you haven't, uh, just feel, please feel free to get in touch with the organisers and we can point people in the right direction to make any connections that need to be made. Um, yeah, thank you again. Thanks everyone. Have a nice afternoon. Mm. Thank you for chairing. Thanks, Philippa. You did a great job. <laughs> <laughs>